So I've been working on a big project over the last few months, looking into how anime has changed stylistically over the years, seeing how different trends have started and evolved. I think one of the most interesting stylistic developments is character designs, arguably one of the most iconic parts of the medium. I think almost everyone is familiar with Japan's crazy designs, you know, whether it be Final Fantasy's explosive hairstyles or the fiery protagonists of the shonen anime. It's all very recognisable and for a reason. And the way in which these styles have developed is so interesting. Some characteristics have stayed since the 60s and some come and go within a decade. I want to have a more detailed look at how exactly these designs have changed over the years. When you look back at the earliest designs, it's very clear what has stayed and what hasn't. And of course a lot of these early designs were heavily influenced by, among other things, the decades of Disney work that came before them. And for many years this influence is very noticeable. What stands out for me immediately is the eyes of the characters. You probably recognise them as a style that is still very popular today. They're drawn as big oval shapes with very large pupils, taking up a huge portion of the character's face. These weren't drawn from realism, but a need for a resourceful way to express emotion. Osamu Tezuka was one of the biggest influences here. Almost all of his early work featured this style. You just look at Astro Boy in 1963 or Dororo in 1969. It's very distinct, but when you watch an episode of one of these shows, you'll notice that the limited animation makes them very important. This style comes in and out of fashion for many genres, but it's always present at least somewhere. The comedy genre, for example, features this style from here till the current day, and you might recognise it from styles of studios like Kyoto Animation. This now called Moe aesthetic has been around since the beginning. It goes back decades and decades. Body shape is something I'm going to keep a close eye on too. Uh, this becomes a huge factor in the development of character designs. Again, it's a very practical evolution during the start. With limited animation resources, simpler designs like Astro Boy were favoured. Bodies were very unrealistic and ended up just a combination of basic shapes. Realism wasn't really in the thoughts of the designers at this point. Even going into the 70s, body shape was still very blocky. Everything kind of merges together like Play-Doh. But you can see more complex designs starting to take place. Joe from Ashita no Joe at the start of the 70s is a great example of where they're going. His design is a lot more mature looking. It's still very simple though, his hair is pretty basic and his clothes aren't that detailed, but it's a big change from the cartoonish designs of the 60s. Space Battleship Yamato's character designs are a reflection of this change too. Here we see a continuation of that more realistic design. This time with a lot more detail and diversity, you can start to identify characters by their clothing and their hair, not just their face. I think what's important to take from this period is the consideration for anatomy. There's a real attempt to capture realistic body proportions, despite how much time that might have added to production. It's very important to keep in mind as we go into the 80s and even more so as we go into the 90s. One of the most exciting periods for anime character designs was in the 80s. That desire for realism mixed with the colourful aesthetic of the decade produced some awesome styles. This is also a decade where mech anime really boomed, so let's start with shows like Mobile Suit Gundam in 1979 and Macross in 1982. I think a lot of the developments made in shows like Space Battleship Yamato were echoed here. Characters were just becoming more and more distinguished. Also, it's quite interesting that the child protagonist that was so popular in the 60s returns, this time a bit older and definitely designed differently. A reflection of the change in markets, possibly. If you look at characters like Amaro from Gundam or Hikaru from Macross compared to Astro Boy, it's a much more realistic, maybe mature design. And this is highlighted even more so as we continue through the decade. One of my favourite examples being Gunbuster in 1988. There's just this huge consideration for human anatomy, especially that of the female body. Clothing becomes an individual object, hair becomes a lot more detail, there's just this huge jump from what we had before. Especially mixed with the vibrancy of the 80s, we get this flood of really awesome designs. Female character designs were becoming extremely popular. When you look at how successful characters like Min Mei from Macross were, it's no surprise that female characters started to become more of a focal point, instead of just a love interest or a plot device. This is accentuated hugely in the 90s, and we'll get to that in a bit. Character designs started gaining complexity in different places. One detail that's worth noting is hair, obviously a massive part of a character design. And there was a period in the 80s where hair developed from a kind of static block shape on a character's head to a more detailed dynamic body part. It became an integral part of a character's identity. In Legend of the Galactic Heroes, for example, hair was just as important as the character's faces. The two main rivals, Yang and Reihard, were almost defined by their hair. Every character had their own distinct look that reflected their personality or their goals. It's such a simple but effective technique, and it's something that's only really possible with a certain level of detail. Another huge trend that was happening was the kind of macho male designs, seen in works like Fist of the North Star and Dragon Ball. Kind of over-exaggerated realism with the use of muscles and veins. And this design has actually become one of the staples of the 80s. It was very, very iconic, and you can see works today like Jojo's Bizarre Adventure still taking inspiration from it. 
I mean, I love this design for its sheer boldness, and it shows the progress that's been made in just a few decades. Towards the end of the 80s, character designs were skyrocketing in complexity and creativity, producing possibly the single most iconic set of anime character designs, Akira. There's something really, really special about these characters. Otomo's designs obviously had a very distinct look, and that translated into the anime, but it was helped by the movie's ridiculous attention to detail. These were some of the most expressive designs yet. Otomo's facial designs are very intricate, allowing them to do a lot, and their simple yet striking clothing choices just elevated that expression. Look at Canada's outfit, for example. It's a simple red jumpsuit, but it's worn with such authority, it makes him look like something from another world. And of course, Tetsuo's cloth cape, it was literally that, a simple piece of red material. But the way in which it became a part of him, a part of the monster with movement in the wind and contrast to his other clothing, it turned a standard teenager into a terrifying villain. Even the side characters are brilliant. The slimy politician with the rodent features and the small body, or, or the military commander, he has his overpowering physique and this tightly kept hairstyle. Akira really has some of the best character designs in anime, and it raised the bar significantly. The 90s was a time of peak realism for character designs. Anatomy was put under a microscope, and the popularity of the sci-fi genre allowed people to really explore this concept. This was also around the birth of digital animation, allowing consistent precision in the animation of characters. A point I really want to look into is Ghost in the Shell's approach to absolute accuracy when portraying the human body, especially that of Motoko Kusanagi. One of the scenes that sticks out to me the most is her fight with the tank at the end. In the movie, she destroys her cyborg body by overusing it, and the animators portrayed her body with such realism that it had massive effect. Her bones, muscles, and proportions are mathematical in their precision. It's a haunting scene because of how realistic it is, and how much importance the movie puts on our characters' bodies. I think this is again one of the best uses of character designs. All the designs are a contrast between humanity and technology, like how Bato conflicts his huge cyborg physique with his fragile feelings for Motoko, or Togaza as a rejection of cyborg bodies, using his classic revolver as a mirror for his more human lifestyle. I think character designs are best when they're saying something. And this style of design is a great example of where character designs were going around this time. This trend didn't really have any moe eyes or unrealistic proportion, and it continues into many of the decade's best work. Satoshi Kon was another huge pioneer of this with his film Perfect Blue. It's another example of that stark realism used to create a more emotional, cinematic experience. Once again, the body of our female lead is visualised very strongly, though unlike Ghost in the Shell, the body is very fragile. The movie creates tension by threatening, fragile perspectives. Just think of how disturbing the fight scene at the end is when one of the characters gets injured. That wouldn't have had the same impact if the designs were less realistic, and the movie hadn't built up this connection. Other great examples of this trend would be Jinro, Cowboy Bebop, or Berserk. They all have this really unique take on the characteristics of the 90s. Berserk is a great one to look at. Obviously, Guts is a super iconic design with his massive sword and spiky hair. Berserk designs its characters to create horror and distress, mixing human and demon designs together. They also do that character contrast with Guts and Griffin, in a similar way to Legend of the Galactic Heroes, representing different beliefs and personalities with their starkly different designs. It's one of my favourite uses of this technique. And of course, I can't forget Cowboy Bebop's designs that may just be some of the coolest in the medium. Each character is designed with a clear, standout personality. Spike's jazzy hair and suit reflect his easygoing ethos. Faye's revealing outfit shows her confidence and sexual appeal. And Jet's tough design with bold facial hair and simple looking clothes back up his no nonsense personality. This period of character designs from Akira to Bebop are some of my all time favourites. There's something about the mixture between that classic art style and the desire for realism that sits so well with me. But the other side of the 90s was very much a continuation of the 80s, taking that bright, bombastic art style of shows like Macross and injecting them with some much needed complexity and polish. One of the standouts being Escaflone. I've still yet to see something that's even remotely similar to this show. At first glance, you can kind of tell that these are really old school designs. You can see the larger eyes are extremely prominent here. The character designs are very loud, almost like a kind of JRPG or something. Here has taken another drastic change as well, moving away from the style of 80s to a more unrealistic design, adding in reflective lighting into the hair, which has kind of become a trope at this point. I love these designs anyway, they're a really unique blend of fantasy and sci fi, and the level to which they were animated is astonishing. This is a really cool period of anime character design, and of course, the character designs of mech anime don't stop there. Evangelion had a cast of very simple but unforgettable characters. Ava loves to utilise colour contrast when designing its characters. Even the mechs, which become characters of their own, all stick to a very specific colour palette. And this technique is used in every detail of character design. You can take any individual detail about a character and people will be able to recognise it. They're just really great designs and a real example of what was popular at the time.
Going into 2000, there was a number of factors that caused an increase in the amount of anime, and the amount of access studios had to make more experimental projects for smaller markets. This just exploded the amount of development and character designs. There's so much to talk about, and, and obviously I'd be here all day if I talked about every individual style, but I'll try my best to cover the most important ones. We can't really talk about the early 2000s without mentioning Kyoto Animation's early designs. And when we talk about the bright-eyed Moe aesthetic, this is really the height of it. I mean, just look at shows like Air or Canon. These designs are unapologetically cutesy, and I have to say, I'm not a huge fan of this style. It's far too obnoxious, but the studio do refine it in later years. By the time we get to K-On, for example, it does still have that cutesy design, but it's a lot more subtle and easier on the eye. You can really see how over the last 15 years or so, so many designers have tried to replicate the characters of Kyoto Animation. They've almost become a stylistic trend of their own, kind of kickstarting that Moe aesthetic every everybody talks about these days. I think another branch of designs that is similar but follows a different path is the more experimental designs, popularised recently by the studio Shaft. Designs like the Monogatari series or Madoka Magica are hugely popular, and these designs have an equally interesting heritage. Towards the end of the 90s and in the beginning of the 2000s, there was a really interesting wave of experimental anime, shows that were made for very small audiences and niche demographics. Serial Experiments Lane or Boogie Pop Phantom are prime examples of this style, and you can really see how they've evolved. They're obviously known for how dark they are, but their core designs aren't a far stretch from the more mainstream designs. I mean, Lane, for example, could be tweaked a little and easily fit into a design for a comedy show. Her eyes and her hair aren't hugely different, it's the subtle differences that put them apart. This is the key element to how they evolved into the works of Shaft and shows such as Ergo Proxy. They're very much based on more traditional designs, just tweaked subtly to suit their needed atmosphere. From here, character designs have branched out in every direction. Even the most subtle details have become their own styles. It's almost impossible to keep track of everything after a certain point, but you can always have a look at a design and see exactly where its roots are. For example, another style that I really like is the loud designs of shows like Gurren Lagann, Eureka 7, Kill a Kill, super colourful series that have such strong ties to the designs of the 80s. You can see really strong parallels between the designs of the females from Gurren Lagann and the characters of Gunbuster. Simone and Renton are essentially developments of characters like Amuro and Hikaru, or experimental designs like the works of Misaki Uasa. His designs in Kaiba are almost a homage to the very early designs of the 60s, utilising their effective simplicity. It's fascinating to see how everything is connected and can be linked together stylistically, and I'm sure the deeper you dig, the more complex this web of relations will become. It's just fascinating. And I've only just touched on them in this video, so please do share any similarities between designs you like in the comments. It'd be awesome to see what I've missed. I've got a bunch of really similar videos coming up over the next couple of months, so make sure you're subscribed and following my social medias. But for now, why don't you check out another similar video? Or maybe something different? Anyway, thank you very much for watching.